Good afternoon, everybody. Great to see you all here. Thank you so much for joining us. And I will introduce uh, in just a moment our artists, Danny and Sheila Restack. But here you can see them live in person joining us today from Columbus, Ohio. They're not able to be with us in person, but they can see you. So please give them a wave. So delighted. Yay! <laughs> So delighted that they can join us virtually, thanks to the beauty of the technology and the great setup in this room. We know that they've been battling COVID, quarantine, all kinds of other things. So it's a difficult time and we're really grateful that they can take time out uh, to spend a little bit of time with us today. Uh, especially grateful because they actually have recorded their lecture. So in just a moment, we'll start that, we will play that and that's about half an hour or so, and then they will come back live and join in with us for Q&A. So please hold your questions um, to the end. I'd also, as well as expressing my thanks to Danny and Sheila, uh, I would also like to thank Dan Jan, our painting and drawing professor, who introduced us to Danny and Sheila and invited them <laughs> to work with us here <laughs> uh, at TCU. Uh, we're really grateful for that connection and that support. So thank you, Dan, for, um, for introducing us. Uh, and as a quick introduction, because I'm not going to take much time, we're really going to hand it over to Danny and Sheila. Um, but just to introduce them to you briefly, as partners and collaborators, Danny and Sheila Restack make work make work that sort of explores connections between the domestic and the feral in contemporary life, but more especially in their lives, as you'll learn, uh, as you see in their recording. And their approach is really fascinating. It weaves together sort of real and mythical understandings of family, of intimacy, of place, of sort of situational specificity, as Donna Haraway calls it, and also ideas about desire and ritual. And they very often employ aspects of social practice and performance. And we're delighted that we're able to present one of their performances this evening in a different format as part of their outdoor screening uh, of Shameless Light. And that will be a very specific examination of queerness and site-specific histories. I should also say they're very, um, very fond of kind of considering a post uh, a post human consideration of our existence on the planet. So humans and animals and those relationships between humans and animals often show up in their work too, and it certainly does here um, at TCU. Uh, the Restacks have been collaborating for many years. They've shown together at the 2017 Whitney Biennial. Their work has also been shown at Iceberg Projects Toronto, uh, sorry, Iceberg Projects Chicago, the Toronto International Film Festival, the Rotterdam International Film Festival, the Columbus Museum of Art, and I could keep going with many other nationally and internationally recognized venues, but also to tell you that they are successful uh, grant writers. <laughs> they have received grants from the Canada Council for the Arts and the Ohio Arts Council, and they have also been um, active residents at the Headlands in Marin County, uh, the McDowell Residency, which is very prestigious, and one of my particular favorites, the Visual Studies Workshop in New York, which is an amazing organization. If you don't know about them, graduate students, you should look them up, amazing. But you can learn much more about them from their websites and from their talk that's coming up in just a moment. And just to uh, sort of introduce their project here at TCU, uh, Danny and Sheila are presenting a stack for Martha's Sisters uh, over at the Contemporary, and we've extended the exhibition an extra week. So you have next week, you have until October 30th to go over there and enjoy that. It's a video installation. It's a queer feminist imagining of alternative spaces, alternative spaces of being, of family, of creation, of camaraderie, of dreaming, of wishing, regretting? I don't know. Uh, it was very much inspired by the Sanctified Sisters of Belton, Texas. And if you haven't heard of them, wiki them immediately. Uh, a fascinating group of women uh, founded by Martha McWhorter in the late 1860s. Martha had a dream or a very particular type of religious vision or kind of a moment uh, where she thought about separating from her husband and making community with other women who are similarly interested. And their story in Belton, Texas in the 19th century is a really fascinating part of Texas history that I never knew about. And it took artists from Columbus, Ohio to open our eyes to this amazing story. Uh, both artists have established careers of their own individually. And for the sake of time today, I'm not gonna go through the list of their accolades and achievements. 
Uh, but safe to say they're also both teaching professionals. Danny teaches as assistant, sorry, associate professor of art at Ohio State University. And Sheila is associate professor of art and chair of the studio art department at Denison University in Ohio. But we're going to let them say hello very quickly to you in person. And then we're going to turn on to their recording and we'll go from there. Hi. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you. And uh, the thing that... Um, Sarah Jane mentioned about the visual studies workshop uh, is, is neat because they are starting to produce books, uh, companion books to films. So um, that's our next sort of, you're gonna see the second video in our trilogy um, and they're gonna be making a companion text to the whole trilogy. And it's just a really neat place to um, take workshops and they have a small residency program so that's definitely something to keep on your radar uh, for things to do post-graduation or even a summer, summer uh, session. So we hope you uh, like this and we're definitely curious of your curiosities afterwards. Yeah, for sure. And we have like a, since we pre-recorded it, we have a time where we're thanking everybody. And um, so we won't like bore you by doing it twice but um but we do want to say a big thank you to everyone and sarah jane thanks for that beautiful introduction and both Lene and sarah jane for setting up all the technical stuff for today thank you guys and we'll see you um pretty soon and like danny said really looking forward to your questions hi everybody um my name is sheila restack and i'm, I'm danny restack and we're really happy to be here with you. Um, so sorry that we're not in person right now. That was the plan. And we've had a lot of um, setbacks this past little while. And um, the latest one is that I got a breakthrough case of COVID. So um, we've been home together, living the feral domestic dream for the last <laughs> 10 days. Um but thank you for being here, and um, we will join you live for the Q&A at the end. Um, and we just really want to thank the TCU galleries and all the work that Sarah Jane Parsons and Lene Cravens have done, as well as Corey Thompson and Chris Zwicker, who helped install. And um, a big thank you to our dear friend, Dan Jan. So we're going to show you work. Uh, some images that trace our work building projection installations, which is what's at the gallery, and then follow that with discussion of shameless light that you'll be seeing an iteration of tonight. Some of the questions we are often asking is, what does it mean to create relation, to have desire, to be a queer family? How can these things exist outside of the patriarchal, heteronormative, white imperialist structure. Can they? Are we ever free? Can the work make us free? Our work doesn't necessarily answer these questions, but they are the ones we keep coming up against, striving through, towards, and likely will for as long as we are making. For instance, the work we are presenting today is made in collaboration, and this has been a strategy for sharing curiosity, and also a strategy for exiting certain conceptions of authorship and singularity. We changed our last name so that we could share a name that didn't exist inside the confines of a patriarchal lineage. We wanted something that could allow in new possibility. At the time we changed our name, we were reading Ann Carson's float series of chapbooks, one of which is a list of stacks. I remember both of us feeling this poem. I said to Danny, I love the stacks because Ann Carson wrote to them, but also because of the heterogeneity of the stack. The way in which they uniquely function is making sense only to the one who makes the stack. It drives me crazy to see my wife's stacks around the house. They make no sense to me. But that illogic is precisely the thing I also love. Each one a stratified reason. I see the stack as a fluid container and a catalyst that is infinitely recognizable, inextricably linked to the domestic space, and yet an always possible container for reimagining hierarchies and materials. And I strive to stack love over fear. When we came to Fort Worth, we were not sure what we were going to make in response to the site. We knew we wanted to work with the projection installation. 
a strategy that had begun when working with a love letter we had written to our daughter and to Lenora Carrington's short story, The Debutante. In this installation, a still image was projected into the corner and materials we used to build it out included paper, plywood, balsa wood, paint, glitter, charcoal, and tape. Soft and hard meet up, there's a celebration of color and an encounter with fantasy through the banal act of taking a bath. This was one of the first times we conjured the feral domestic as a formal and conceptual potential in terms of the possibility of making something out of our everyday spaces. In the story The Debutante, Carrington trades places with a hyena who has become her friend. She tries to disguise the hyena as human. In this case, Sheila bends into the newspaper, becoming the newspaper, morphing and escaping. A sea of yellow surrounds her, and yet it is the paper that is the portal. Color, shape, form, material choices are the impetus for a new way of paying attention, of making sense, of making a world on top of the world that already exists. In group shows, we need to construct a space to hold the projected, faceted world. I like that the projection ends up needing its own structure, its own house that is not a house, a home for altered reality, a temporary construction. Here pictured is the love letter to Rose that Danny just talked about inside a group show at Ortega y Gasset Gasset Space in Brooklyn, New York. Once we understood the projection as a way to remake space, we made another one in Ohio at the Columbus Museum of Art and then another in Chicago at Iceberg Projects. We changed from still image to video. We began to use the kitchen as a site, in this case shown here at Iceberg Projects with all of us stacked on the floor. The video we shot hovers between still and movement. We are trying to keep still but the viewer can see movements, breathing, adjustments occurring as the body shifts to get comfortable as the video loops. We also begin to use white light as a way to reveal the set, to show the construction, to allow it to become abstraction. The surety of the way the image maps is taken away. We are no longer grounded in the figures in space. It becomes material and color, insulation foam, house paint, chalk, hair, screen, felt, glitter, duct tape, lamb's wool, rubber bands, acetate. The structure it is projected onto was built to accentuate various aspects of the image. You can see how Rose's hand is in the foreground projected on styrofoam. The tangerines on the counter sprinkle with glitter and sparkle. We choose what is important and make a system that brings specific aspects forward or back. We sometimes think of it like choosing the parts of reality that get to be seen, remaking the image in the way that we see fit. For instance, here the balsa wood is bent to push out the projected image of the plates. The balsa mimics the curve of the plates. It is the structure that makes the dishes come forward. Here it is with white light, a shape, waiting for the image to return and things to fall back into sense. Each area of white is a place where the dishes live. (laughs) So here it is with the projection and here without. Okay. So we have solo practices and they get infused into our collaborative practice. On the left is a piece of Sheila's that's built with felted photography, a photograph, fiber prints, acetate, and and a concrete wedge. On the right is my drawing with ink and stand oil. Working together allows us to make things that develop through a third energy generated between us. The videos we have made together hold the same thread of being of the real, meaning often inspired by what is happening in the moment with our family with documentary impulses and alignments, but also choosing to make it fantastical or to try to solve some of the problems of one reality with the creation of a more experimental and differently felt story. We like to mix ideas, images, and materials as ways to make sentences, to make sense calling through materials, color, sound, and history to access new ways of knowing or feeling. 
We'd like to share a video we made with you. It's the second in our trilogy that begins with Strangely Ordinary, this devotion. This video is seven minutes and is called Come Coyote. It gives you an idea of how some of the conflicts we have in our relationship end up becoming part of the work and how the work is both documentary of our lives, in this case of a DIY insemination as we fight over whether to have more children. We also fabricate stories or myths in this case, following the narrative from SOTD, or Strangely Ordinary, this devotion, about children who will survive the environmental collapse of our planet if they receive the spell of the lesbian witches who can allow them to live without water. Please don't worry if you don't understand all of what I am saying or explaining, or it doesn't become immediately clear upon viewing the piece. Maybe see what happens if you allow yourself to follow the sound, color, logic of the forms and feelings. Des ongles, à des chevaux, à des chevaux, et aussi un Pegasus, et mélangé, et les manger, visage, et visage, de quill, de quill. It's too hard. It wasn't soft as hard. Oh, that's okay. I, I, I saw the picture I thought it was soft. Oh, yeah. So we're going to do it like this. Let's okay. get some lube out. Who would that kill it? Oh, I don't know. That organic lube won't kill it. How do you do this? You just got to be really quiet. Okay. Here it comes. Sure, are you ready? Yeah. Okay, now. I don't want you to... Am I hurting you? Can I keep going? I think that's good. Okay, relax. Open up, open up, open up. Okay, here it comes. Here it comes. Here you go. <coughs> oh. oh, it's coming out. <coughs>
so many things that's held us down But now it looks like things are finally coming around I know we've got a long, long way to go And where we'll end up, I don't know When we came to Texas, we were not sure what we were going to make in response to the site, but we were intrigued by the idea of somehow connecting to this location. And when doing a search for women's lands, we came across the Sanctified Sisters of Belton, Texas. The Sanctified Sisters were begun by Martha McWhorter in the 1860s. Martha was a religiously devout woman who had a vision, in one place I read it said the vision was in the kitchen that instructed her to separate from her husband and to invite other women to do the same if they so desired. The community sustained through the early 20th century when using one of their practices of listening to dreams as decisions they moved to Washington DC based on one such dream. There's not a lot of information on the Sanctified Sisters. I'm sure if you Google them you will quickly have almost as much information as we were able to glean. We do know that Martha was the leader that they were at first shunned by the Belton community for defying the patriarchal and heteronormative order, and then they were eventually accepted as they became economically self-sustaining. The above photo shows some of the sanctified sisters and children during their time in Belton. And even with a trip that Sarah Jane and Lynnae took to Belton, there was little that could be found in terms of documentation of their lifestyle or any kind of relics for the time they were living as a community with up to 30 women and children in Martha's home. Her husband relocated as he and Martha were separated after her revelation. Here is the historical plaque in Belton that gives the information we have about the group of women led by Martha. The previous image shows some of the sanctified sisters during their time in Belton, Texas. Based on wanting to connect with the Sanctified Sisters, we tried to find a similar location in Ohio. We found the Susan B. Anthony Memorial Lands, which is a large acreage in southern Ohio that is available for women and women-identified people to camp or live. We camped in the Star Cabin as we saw a sideways line being drawn between the Sanctified Sisters and the alternative community they were creating and the one that was available outside Athens, Ohio. For the exhibition here at TCU, we shot ourselves, our family, stacked up in the outdoor kitchen of the Susan B. Anthony Memorial land. Here again, our bodies disrupt the kitchen environment, making a new kind of shape, a new kind of sense out of the domestic. In this case, the whole kitchen has gone feral, as it is an outdoor space, yet it still holds markers of the domestic, enough of them to understand that this is a place of meal preparation and gathering. When the white light comes on, the whole set is revealed. Our bodies become matte white against the styrofoam and the whole installation is little more than blocks of color, shape, folds, and the leaning of materials. When you enter the TCU gallery, the first image is a bed, which we are interested in including as another type of domestic portal that holds all kinds of taboos written into it, namely desire, sex, but also nexus of family. I love that the sight line here is of the bed, which actually has all of us in our family under the covers, and with, has a view through to the kitchen with the same pile of people in a different, unrecognizable jumble. One of the things that I often consider is how it seems there is such pressure to not speak of being a desiring person at the same time as one is a parent or part of a family, like desire is antithetical to being a parent. 
although ostensibly desire was, for many, part of what may have led to becoming a parent. Queer desire, queer parenting, queer families, these are all things that hold a similar discomfort in, sp in speaking about them or acknowledging them, and the bed kind of holds all of these unspoken things inside of itself. Again, a view to when the image goes off, and you can see the lines here extending from the beam and across the lines of the gallery that connect the various projections. The projector in the corner are of two horses at the star cabin, and it was also a nod to Texas and the desire to channel horses as a way of finding relation with narratives of the West. In this case, this the horses are held outside of the star cabin, a silver octagonal cabin made by women at the Susan B. Anthony, Anthony Memorial Land many years ago. To me, the horses seem like they are being reappointed for some feminist queer getaway animal. Here they are just waiting, and it really felt that we were undermining some larger narrative when we were working with them as we rented them from some true cowboys who were definitely thinking we were the strange ones as we led them into the kitchen, lay on them, and held them outside the silver star cabin on the women's land. When the white light comes on, it is revealed as a structure re for receiving image with the ghost of the images left on it. The balsa wood is bent to receive the nose band, but the horses move. They are alive, and they don't stay still. The nose bands slide off the receiving balsa wood, but return. The hole cut through the cardboard lets Sheila's arm shine through in the back. And you can see this better when you're in person in the show, how the arm kind of shows up on the far, um, far structure through the hole. The movement of light in between the forms is mediated by sound. We won't tell you what it is. You'll need to go and see the show. We hope you go and see it. It's open tonight from 5 to 7, followed by Shameless Light, and Sarah Jane is keeping the show up through the first week of November. We wanted to make a shout out here for Shameless Light this evening, which we are so excited to have occur, and want to thank the letter writers Mara Guardiola, B. Gray, Kim Yun, Ivy Disler, and Sharon Herrera. This is a part of our collaborative practice as well, The Shameless Light, and it has been since 2016 when we first performed it with others in Carrizozo, New Mexico, in response to the, to the election of Trump, and at the time, we were feeling pretty hopeless. We wanted to do something that would be a way towards action in the face of despair. Love letters seemed like one way to do so. We have been working with Shameless Light as live performance since that time. There is an impetus in our work, as you can see, to establish historical connections through time and space, to make community and to consider oneself a part of history that may not be readily visible in mainstream society. Shameless Light is another way to offer, become, solicit, and find community. In this case, it is through the articulation of queer love and desire. In these images, you can see um, one such live iteration at the um, University of uh, Illinois, Chicago. Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> and um, just to clarify what's going on, the each reader comes up to the mic and stands before the neon, and then you can see there's a video that's playing through a pegboard. So um, that video is, is another element. It's an homage. It's our love letter to Chantel Ackerman. Yeah. So just to clarify what you're seeing. Um, yeah, so... Um, and at first we had neon that spelled out Shameless Light, and people read in front of it. That was in its first iteration in Carrizozo, but it changed to become these megaphones um, that create a lexicon of conversation between forms, ways to amplify voice, and also they demonstrate for me an intimacy um, as they are facing and speaking to one another. We have performed Shameless Light in six locations across the U.S. 
Before we arrive at a place, we try to make contact with queer community. We solicit queer women identified from the community to read love letters in front of our audience. People have written to lovers, friends, places, or communities. For the Texas iteration tonight, it will be projected outdoors. This is the first time we are seeing it as a pre-recorded projection. We are nervous and excited about the way in which queer love will be taking up space in a public area of campus. Um, and we wanted to uh, close close <laughs> with a uh, example of what you will see if you can come to the screening tonight. This is a letter by Sharon Herrera. Dear my Marcel, my why, 28 years apart is a long time, and now I must confess that walking out on you was the worst mistake that I had ever made. Our lives went on separately. I could function, but there was always something missing. When you walked back into my life in 2012, all the feelings I ran away from in 1984, the moments we shared, our first kiss, the music we danced, came rushing back. It was as if God knew I was lost and granted my soul a second chance. I didn't understand love back then. I was young, trying to find myself and where I fit in. I know I hurt you. Please forgive me. I know where I fit in now, in your arms. And I promise I will love you till my last breath. It is true, and I've heard this before, when two hearts meet after being apart for years, the world fades away as they meet and share the purest of loves. They are invincible at that moment, and that is the magic of our love. Do you remember these lyrics? I have a picture pinned to my wall, an image of you and of me, and we're laughing and loving it all. This song always took me back to you in those 28 years. The lyrics in the next song are my promise to you. Here we go. Solamente la mano de Dios podrá separarnos. Nuestro amor es más grande que todas las cosas del mundo. Yo sé bien que nacimos las dos para siempre adorarnos. Nuestro amor es lo mismo que el mar, cristalino y profundo. Tú no puedes dejarme de amar ni yo de adorarte porque estamos unidos del alma quién sabe hasta cuándo yo seré para ti nada más te lo digo llorando cuando tú me trajiste tu amor ya te estaba esperando I love you more so. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that um, presentation. And um, I'm going to be singing that Thompson Twins song for the rest of the day now. <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to invite you uh, to put forward questions or comments, any observations you'd like to share with the artists or with your, with your colleagues here. Adriana, do you want to come up and sure. just so that we can capture you on the sound? Hi, um, you were, you were uh, saying words like domestic portal. So I was wondering if you can expand more on those ideas. Um, thank you. I, I love the idea of a portal uh, as a place that could launch you somewhere else than um, where you currently are. And I don't think that's something that is uh, particular to any person like I feel we all have the capacity to do it because um, as we know from quantum physics like the world is not only what we can see and so um, sometimes in a drawing course uh, we've invited students to draw a portal and live with that drawing in order to um, try to enter it and uh, so I just feel that this is a a way through, but she said domestic portal. You wanna? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, all of that 
some, I was actually thinking about a drawing exercise that Danny had done using like domestic objects as like portal objects. And, and I think that, um, you know, like Danny said, like, I feel like portals are, you know, it feels like that's something that would appear like in a science fiction book, but I like the idea of like them being accessible to any of us. Um, and, and I really love the idea of like making do with what's available and what's at hand. So in terms of thinking about a portal, it's like, well, why not in the domestic space? You know, like why not believe that there's the possibility for fantasy within within our domestic space because that's what we have available. You know, in our case, like we have a family. Um, it's harder to leave. <laughs> and um, so so yeah, just like thinking about the idea that there's the possibility for um, other realities inside of that domestic space that sometimes seems kind of foreclosed, you know, like it has a particular yeah. way of being seen. Well, and it takes a, a intentional action to get there because like I can get completely caught up in like, oh my God, the baby just spilled, you know, milk all over the car. I got to get to the car wash. Uh, this is going to rot in the summer. I mean, I could get all caught up in health insurance and bills and but um so it takes a intention it takes like um constantly remembering and it can simply be paying attention to what's in front of us because it's just once you pay attention it's like whoa i didn't even think about the fact that that upholstery on that chair you know was sewn in some kind of mechanical loom i mean i'm doing it right now i didn't i know, just, I'm just saying, like danny is now staring at a chair yeah <laughs> and it's like there's so much to find um actually i learned from Thich Nhat han he has a book on on food and eating and um he suggests you know turn off the tv put away your phone and pay attention not only to what the taste and texture is but this was grown. There was a farmer, there was land, there was sunshine, there was a truck that shipped it to your grocery store. There was packaging and washing and, and then a, a, a clerk and then the kitchen. And like, it's just, there's endless ways to pay attention. And I think that is a way of, 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 of conjuring a portal. Yeah. There's a, um, there was this beautiful moment. Like, I think it was right during the, um, uh, hey. <laughs> during the beginning of the quarantine we were do talking to somebody doing an interview and they were like what kind of art activity would you suggest for people like now that they're in quarantine that the suggestion that we had was to like put a chair on a table because it's like not only the act of noticing but also being able to notice something differently so like just like the idea that if you even just like put your chair on the table we like hung a bag of water in the kitchen at one point it's that like, showed up in come coyote yeah you guys so we, saw we had a, a table strung between two beams and then hung a bag of water with a feather in it and you had to sort of negotiate the room uh, the room that you're always in the kitchen so it's fun might as well have fun. We're only here for a little bit. And I was just going to say, I'm just like, you can tell, like, we haven't really talked to people in a while. So <laughs> just going on for a long time. All right. Sorry. All right. Next, next, next question. question. Anybody? I had a, a quick question about the collaborative process. Could you talk a little bit about that? How do you construct ideas as a unit? And what are those conversations like? And how do you navigate separate, uh, separate aesthetic sensibilities in a shared composition? Good question, because um, I don't really know if I have an answer to that. Um, we had this really interesting moment where we spoke with, um, I'm sorry, Sarah Jane or Lene, can you remind me of Nino's last name? Nino Testa in Women and Gender Studies program. Yeah, so um, Professor Testa's class, and one of them, I, th I think the question of one of their students was like, um, uh, what maybe like what would your love letter to one another be or something like that and um and I remember just like saying like the fact that we continue to make work together is like a symbol of like love because it's so difficult you know like it's really um I love to pretend that it's like very you know problem free but it's really difficult and um uh, because because we're both really opinionated and strong-willed and, and very different people at the same time. So, um, but 
like amidst the difficulty for myself, at least, I feel like there's something, um, something that happens when both of us are working that is, that couldn't happen otherwise. And I also feel like there is something, I think I spoke to that at the beginning in terms of um, like there's our society just has such a really wants to assign like kind of like solitary genius status, you know, and we still get questions that like, well, who did what? you know, and um, so this idea of like collaborating just like goes so against kind of like capitalist, you know, um, patriarchal conceptions. Um, so I like, I like it for that. I like it for the fact that it allows Danny and I to like have a relationship that, I mean, that video come coyote is about a conflict, a real life conflict. And then we get to like work it out in this like alternative um, universe of of a video you know I mean it didn't solve it didn't change it but I think it helped us be able to like sort process of it. process it and deal with it and kind of use the tools that we have which is like we've spent our whole lives being artists you know so and um yeah I would say uh collaboration is like puts me on the edge of a breakup like it's that hard like because I'm I want it my way and Sheila wants it her way. And we, the fighting happens. I mean, an example for video editing is like um, we have a timer because the mouse, you know, in editing video, you're working on the computer and like we each get five minutes because I will grab the mouse out of her hand. Uh, so we have to come up with <laughs> methods of how to work together. Um, but one of the neatest things for me is like, I, 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 Sheila has ideas I would never dream up. And so it's worth every moment of frustration because things become, um, things happen that I wouldn't have. I love being uh, engaged and challenged. It's like uh, my favorite thing uh, on certain topics. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> uh, but the, the, the thing about um, what the, the content of our lives, you know, it's not, I mean, the thing we teach, you know, and like a self-portrait, it could be a navel gazing act or it could be like, how can I, like home videos, right? Home videos are great. Home video, it's a record. But when you engage formal concerns, uh, it, it moves past it being about us. It's about women it's about our current culture it's about things that i mean it's a collaboration with our world and so uh there is a hierarchy in art you know about the personal versus some kind of conceptual theoretical um approach but personal work is theoretical and political i mean why why do we show sex uh, why did we show a diy insemination well where are the lesbians on the silver screen you know Everybody knows what the homo, uh, hetero looks like. It's, it's a political gesture to include it. And we also, in Strangely Ordinary, This Devotion, we include a, a sex scene by Chantel Ackerman. And it's like the one, it's the one and only lesbian sex scene I've ever seen that is, is accurate. A lot of men make lesbian film and it's pathetic. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that your question about the formal part is is really a good one. But I think that that is like, I think that that's actually like where we, <laughs> that's where, that's like the least of our worries. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like formally, we're pretty much like, you know, we have different formal aesthetics, but we're very aligned, you know, like we're, um, so that's like not our, that's not usually our place of conflict. Mm -hmm. um, it's because we both seem to kind of agree, you know, like once we put something together, like at the show that's up right now, it's like, we both are like, yeah, that works, you know, so. And we work it until it, until it does work. And I was thinking like for people who are curious about collaboration, one thing you could do with your friend or is like go to a museum and you both take different floors. Like one person goes three and one person goes four and you look around and you sense, what am I drawn to here? What repels me? And then you get back together, and, you know, and then you switch floors and you get back together. Like when it happens with us, we're both like, oh my God, did you see that Felix Gonzalez Torres piece? 
And it's like, that's the one I like too. And that helps. It's a good starting point for working together. <laughs> um, yeah. It's funny. I was just funny that you gave them an exercise. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Who does? I love exercises. If anybody has one, please come forth. <laughs> <laughs> question for you from Corey. Okay. <laughs> Um, this is very related to the last question, and I'm not sure if I can like formulate it concisely, but um, I was noticing during your presentation how you kind of center uh, your interpersonal conflicts in your work, and you just spoke a lot about how that works in collaboration, and I was wondering if you could talk about um, like when you first discovered that that was a useful mode of making for you. And like, um, to me, it seems really anti-patriarchal or like anti-establishment to embrace conflict instead of to avoid it. Um, like this acknowledgement of tension seems really important. So I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Wait a minute. Can you talk about it a little bit? Why why did you <laughs> <What>? um, <laughs> exercise for Danny? No, no, no. <laughs> I, 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 no. I agree with that. I think like people are silent, people avoid conflict and all that. But I, I, I'm so interested uh how how you linked it to uh the the patriarchy. Oh, um because we're all supposed to stay in our place and like not um not question how things go, you know? Especially for women. Yeah, maybe for women particularly. I was always taught to be like conflict avoidant and to say, yes, it's fine or I'll deal with it or whatever and not make my conflicts public. But it seems like such a outward facing part of your work. And that seems very like, it seems to work in like a restorative way for your relationship and your work. Yeah, I'm sometimes restorative but, <laughs> but I agree with you Corey and again like thank you so much to Corey and you know um I know we've already mentioned but thank you again for your help with the show um um but I agree like I think that there is um I'm actually reminded of a piece that uh Colette um oh dear I'm forgetting her name but who writes for Glass Tire, um, she sent us a piece by Ann Carson on sound and how people are judged on the kinds of sounds that they make or how they speak and, um, and how that's so gendered, you know, um, and talks about like, you know, like women who are too loud or too, you know, and like how all of those are seen as like negatives. And I think that that to me, like also feels like how um, conflict is seen, you know, like, it's like, well, you don't want to like, you know, you don't want to be the difficult person, or you don't want to like, you know, admit that you're having troubles, um, or, or show them to the world, you know, <laughs> like, it's like, maybe your therapist, but certainly not the world. Um, so I, I guess, like, I, I agree, like, I think, I think that that, but I would probably, I would guess that probably for yourself and myself, it, like, I mean, most of the time, the reason we're making work is to figure out some kind of conflict. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, we're like in dialogue with, with the world and whether it's our partner or, you know, whatever, I think we're like trying to figure something out, which you could see as being like um, in the family of conflict or conversation, you know? Um, so, so I, 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 I agree. Like sometimes I think that there's like a kind of like overarching narrative that art will heal everything, you know, like it's going to make everything better. And, um, and I, I, that would also be great. Um, and there are, there are pieces that there's art that's done that, but I do feel like there's something to be said for like allowing conflict to come forward and allowing the reality and the messiness of like domestic space to come forward and be seen and see that as generative, you know, like it's not a negative thing necessarily. Yeah, and I, yeah, definitely. And I, I would just jump in with it also being tied to art therapy. Like, that's another thing that has a bad name in the art world. Like, oh, it, it's a therapy. Uh, and to me, it's like, of course it is. Why else would I make work except to like, find a way through? And I think about the my foremothers, like, what did Louise Bourgeois spend her life doing? sort of reckoning with her relationship with her father, 
so many artists do it. And I, I don't have any doubt that, I mean, I was homophobic and I made about five years of, of work trying to come out of the closet. And I made things that represented that. And, and I went out and then I came back and I was sprayed. So that was healing for myself. But then lo and behold, some other closeted person comes to the show and it seems useful to them. So I, I also think like taking care of oneself is of use to others. I think we're going to uh, have to wrap it up, but I think we have one final question from Dan. We have a couple of minutes left. Okay. Let's see you, Dan. Hi. <laughs> Thanks. So um, one of the biggest things that, I, so, by the way, Danny was my mentor, friend, and uh, teacher at Ohio State. Um, one of the biggest takeaway was the, the willingness and the bravery uh, to be vulnerable in your work. We make very different work, but I always remember like the strengths of making have to come from within. And I feel like both of you do this really well. Can you speak to uh, the audience? Many of them are grad students and the art student in TCU about uh, finding that vulnerability and the willingness to work with that. How do you do it? Yeah. Um, and I, I would say our work's not that different, Dan, because it's, it's you know, there's curiosity at the root of it. And I guess I could say that I am curious of my own vulnerable places, those tender spots in the, the belly where, you know, I want to put up armor. But like you said, it, there's courage in shedding the armor and finding out what's there. And then why would we do that in, in public? Uh, <laughs> um. I, because because we can because it, I have, we haven't seen like we haven't seen it it's like it's real <laughs> like it's uh I guess like that's for and I think that that was it kind of goes back to that question about collaboration because I think that there's a certain amount of courage it's like why we look for community like so much it's like there's courage to be garnered like by doing something with another understanding oneself in relation to to others you know um but yeah I think I don't know. You could, I'm sure that you could argue that it's not good to like bring your um, arguments into public space, but, but, but I, I feel like, you know, why not? If, if, if that's what we have, you know, it goes back to that question of like what making work with what's available to you. It's like, well, this is like part of like the conflict that is, you know, in our relationship. So, mm -hmm. well, and I have a, a closing exercise for you. Um, because you don't only have to look at the liabilities. Like, I think that the, the, the flip side of a liability is an asset, like a liability. You guys know, I was in Texas. We were together trying to install something. I, we were up on this ladder in the night and, um, we didn't lock it because my liability is an impulsive nature. Like I get so excited and especially under a deadline of an exhibition and all these things, uh, I didn't lock the ladder. So I wiped out. Okay. There's a liability. The asset part of it is that I don't overthink, you know, I get down to business because I'm so, ex it's like a asset. So, so the little exercise would be, you know, in order to get to your vulnerabilities, um, would be to to question what where do I you know have issue like what is hard for me here but look at what could be um like Sheila said garnered from it like what could be plus two like I'm just thinking like you guys you're in school like there's like no time <laughs> like we would like both of us fantasize about like just being able to be back in a place where all you are responsible for is like besides maybe a job but you're making work and there's no time like now to practice being vulnerable because you have to you know go out into the world and like find rationale and you know explain yourself so I feel like there's like 
no better time than right now to like push yourself to a place of discomfort, you know, because if you don't do it now, like then when will you, you know? So, um, so I think that that's like, you're in a community of people who support you. It it just, it really doesn't get much better than this (laughs) in terms of like (laughs) making work. And um, so don't be, don't be afraid. I, I, yeah. Please join me in uh, thanking Danny and Sheila with a round of applause. Thank you all for your time. And everybody, if you haven't seen their show yet, please scurry on over to Fort Worth Contemporary Arts this afternoon, or you can come during six to eight for the reception this evening or next week. It's up till the 30th. So please come by and Danny and Sheila, goodbye. Take care, be safe. And we'll see Danny next week is going to be visiting campus for studio visits. Thank you both so much. We appreciate it. And Thank thanks you. to Rose too for babysitting. That was awesome. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>